Amen. Can you say amen? Happy Easter, everybody. How's it going? You can sit down. Happy Easter, everybody. Just a shout out to a few people online. Haley Robinson, Donna Schmoody, Betty Urso, and Elizabeth McCray. Good to have you guys. And also everybody that's here. How many of us are um, will admit that you have kids or grandkids and you steal their candy? How many of you know what I'm saying? Well, borrow. How many of you know what I'm saying? All of the investments you've made in the candy before, you're like, this is nothing. This is just a small payback for all of the stuff that, uh, that, you, that they did before. I don't know about you, but I just love it. I mean, I, how many of you are sweet people? Just in case you didn't know, there will be sweets in heaven. Okay, just in case you didn't know. Hey, I want to thank everybody um, for coming this morning. And I also want to thank you for honoring the Lord with your tithes and your offerings. Obviously, during COVID, we don't pass a bucket or anything like that. But there's boxes on the back wall or um, you can't miss them in the balcony or on the back wall. But also you can give through the church website or the church um, app. And then you can also text and give. And so I just want to thank everybody for your just your faithfulness and consistency consistency. God gives us all that we have. And then the Bible says that as we're faithful, then he pours out greater in and over our life. I think sometimes in our lives, we think, well, God, greater would be maybe an amount. Well, that is true. But I think this, that if we're not walking in life, no amount causes us to walk in life. No amount causes us to be whole or to be healthy. Only he does that. Well, anyway, happy Easter. Um, I think that, you know, when you think about Easter, and I was just really praying about um, Easter a lot, is one of the hindrances we as Christians, I believe, um, have is our inability to connect um, you know, personally with some of the accounts in the Bible because they, they use terms, they use words, there's cultural things. It's a, an agronomic society, so everything's about planting and sheep and all of that kind of stuff. And, and, then, and then not to mention that, but there's a gap in time between when it actually happened and we look at the crucifixion, we look at the resurrection, and we look at the life of Jesus. Um, but when they were recorded, what is really really important is that we understand that it was it was incredibly contemporary. If you look at some of the stories that Jesus told, they were contemporary stories as to what was going on in his day. And so what I want to do, and I want you to maybe humor me a little bit, but I want you to kind of, and this isn't a negative thing, but I want you to kind of take off maybe the religious hat of you came to church and you're going to hear a traditional Easter sermon about the resurrection of Jesus and that I want you to kind of take that hat off just for a moment and I want to just ask you maybe a question anybody ever think of what it would be like if this Sunday was the was actually literally Easter Sunday Jesus was crucified three days ago and then it's, we are right now at Easter Sunday, and all of us during his three and a half years of ministry had been following him. We were believing him to set up his kingdom. We were believing him to kind of fix everything. We were believing for him to fix our politics. How many of you are with me on that? We were believing him to do all of those types of things. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he is crucified, and now we're here on Sunday Sunday morning, and Jesus, I mean, previously, for the previous 33 years, he was on the earth, he was walking in the flesh. This is the first Easter, and we don't know yet that the resurrection has occurred. There's only a couple of people that maybe know that, the, a couple of girls that know that the resurrection occurred, and we'll just say that, that, that maybe, you know, that's that Stephanie is, is one of them, and who else is super spiritual? Let's just be honest. How many of you know what I'm saying? You can lift, you can lift your hand. Maybe, you know, St Stephanie is one of them, and, and, and you know, I mean, Sandy's the other one, and these are the two girls, and we're sitting here in church, and, and we're just like, it's over, it's done, and they come kicking in the door, and they're like, he's alive! Jesus is alive! 
And how many of you know, we'd just be like, okay, get the girls. How many of you know what I'm saying? It, <laughs> but I, wanna, I want you to think about this for a moment. And I want us to just reflect on this. Since Jesus was 30 years old, when he, started, when he started his ministry, and he ministered for three years, that would have put him born at 1988, if we we're gonna kind of extrapolate this out. In 1984 was the first commercial cell phone market. How many of you remember the old bricks? How many of you know what I'm saying? They look like a suitcase, carry-on bag. That is, is um, in, think about this, is in 1993, the World Trade Center bombing occurred and Jesus would have been five. If he had been born in 1980, 1988, and he was crucified this past Friday and we're on Easter Sunday morning. In 1994, the first flip phone came out and Jesus would have been six years old. Does anybody have a flip phone in here? Anybody have a flip phone? Anybody? Okay, think about this for a moment. In 1997, social media launched, and Jesus would have been nine years old. By 2000, social media had fully exploded. 2000s, and you know, how many of you remember MySpace? And then Facebook kind of came out, is terrorists flew planes into the Twin Towers in 2001, and Jesus would have been 13 years old. I remember where I was standing when I heard about it. I was here at church, and I remember someone came running up to me with their cell phone, and they showed me the pictures of what was going on, and I remember where I was standing, and I remember two days after they flew those planes into the World Trade Center, they did a national poll in a America, and they said, what is the greatest need in America? Do you know that number one was God? Number one was God. Two days. Isn't it amazing how things cause us to go back? They cause us to say, wow, what's really, really important? The first iPhone was released in 2007. Jesus would have been 19 years old. Let me just throw this out. How many of you think if Jesus was 19 when they came out and then started his ministry, you know, a few years later, how many of you believe Jesus would have had an iPhone? Come on, I do. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Forget the, can you text Peter? Where is he at? How many, well, Lord, would you rather FaceTime him? How many of you know what I'm saying? You know, you, you stop and you, you think about all of, all of this kind of stuff that happened. In 2008 was the Great Recession, and Jesus would have been 20 years old. How many think that Jesus would have texted? I believe he would. He, if you look, he, he used, utilized everything, every tool. Facebook, social media, would have had a face, you know what I'm saying, social media. When you stop and you think about it, he did, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, how many of you know? And <laughs> Jesus wouldn't have needed Google because he knows everything. They would have said, hey, can you go, oh, let me just tell you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you stop and you, th and you, you think about, you know, Google map, oh, I can tell you how to get there. <laughs> you know, if, if you think about it, if Jesus was born in 1988, his entire last year of ministry would have been during COVID. This whole past year would have been Jesus' last year of ministry. He would have seen fear that has gripped not just America, but gripped the world. I believe that his message would have been contemporary to their day. And if you stop and you think about it, he'd have been ministering to people's spirit, soul, and body, and healing physical conditions. Is there any doubt as to the size of crowds that would have showed up with COVID to be healed? Think about this for a moment. There are accounts in the Bible where it says Jesus healed them all. He healed everybody there. He healed them all. When COVID gripped 
the world and gripped our country? Is there any with social media platform being available? I don't know who this Jesus guy is. He's some religious guy. You know what? He's really, really nice. But this is what I notice is everybody that has COVID gets around him and they come back with a negative test result. Is there any question you stop and you think, I, you know, and I mean, just to kind of fast forward it, the outcome would have been the same. He would have been crucified and he would have rose on the third day. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because the Bible tells us it was preordained and a prophecy to pay for your and my sins. So he would have come for that. Is there any doubt with social media and everything that's out there, the broadness? And I want to just ask you a question. Would my faith or my pursuit of him been different if Friday he was crucified? Yesterday, all you knew, you'd followed him for the three years. And yesterday, all you knew is he was dead. And today, you came to church and you're like, didn't go. And during the worship service, Jesus walked in the aisle stood up on the stage and said, y'all, you know, he's got a Texas accent. <laughs> y'all, it's over. Think about that for a moment. Think about that. He told them over and over again during his natural life how it was going to end, that he was going to be crucified. He told them over and over again. And you stop and you think about that. Is on the first Easter... It's very different from today because they didn't have a Bible. They didn't have, they didn't know. They didn't, they, they didn't, they wouldn't embrace the story that he told them he was going to be crucified. They had forgotten what he had said, and all they know is that he's dead. And what I want to do is I want to look at four different, what I'm going to call people or groups. And I want us to contemporize their story for an application to our lives. Ones that were with him before and ones that we see after the resurrection for an application for our life. And as we look at these four different either individuals or groups, what I want you to do is I want you to maybe pick which one fits you where you're able to stop and you're able to look and say, oh, I can, I can kind of see myself. And please understand, this is not a condemnation. This is not a gotcha moment. This is every one of these groups that we're going to go over were followers of Jesus. Every single one of these groups of people were following him. And so it, realize that I believe this Easter that Jesus wants to reveal himself, not as a historical figure, but as the one who cares, as the one who sees, as the one who knows, as the one who believes in us, the one who wants to lift, the one who wants to heal, the one who wants to pour hope out into our life. This Easter, Jesus is wanting us, just like the first Easter, to say, you know what? It isn't all over. I'm a good God. I'm a faithful God. I'm a merciful God. And you might have had a setback, but what I want you to do is I want you to assess where are you in these four groups of people? Where are you? Are you with me today? Yeah. Number one is this, the first group, is I'm going to call them, and they'll put it on the screen, the religious box. That's not a negative thing, you know, like, you know, about religion or playing religion. That's not what it is. But what the religious box is, is I believe in and want God, but he must fit into my box. He must. See, this group of people, and we're going to see who it is, from the natural life is working for them. Their religion, 
They've got religion. They go through the motions. They occasionally pray with the kids. They occasionally do a few things. You know what I'm saying? They got the religious. They, they, they're, they're doing it, but God's got to fit into their box. And what you look is that, and what I love about this is that if we could look onto the inside, what it is, the inside, is there is an inside awareness and an inside gnawing and growing inside this particular group that there's got to be more than just natural living. A buck won't do it anymore. Paying off this won't do it anymore. Making this goal won't do it anymore. Marrying that person won't do it anymore. Having four kids and no more won't do it anymore. I need something. There's something more to life than just going through this. I'm religious. I got a box. And I know, and, and the person's name that we're going to look at is a guy by the name of Nicodemus. Everybody say Nicodemus. We have three accounts in the Bible of this guy by the name of Nicodemus and uh, coming to Jesus. And the first one is in John 3, verse 1. It says, now there was a certain man among the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Now, it's really important you understand that as soon as you see that word Pharisee, what they are, the word Pharisee, what it means is a separatist. They're religious elitists. They're people that they love God, they want God, and they're kind of super, super Discipline, not like me when I was young. How many of you are with me on that? Is they were that's that's where they were. And so it says, now there was a certain man among the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Now look at this. He was a ruler, a member of the Sanhedrin among the Jews. Now this is super important that it says he was a ruler, and then the amplified gives us deeper. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin in their day were, were 300 of the most educated, the most elite, the most, what they were in their, viewed in their day as spiritual of all of the nation of, the, of Israel and the Jews. They, were, they, had, they had brilliant minds. They were incredibly sharp. And it tells us that this guy is a member of them, so he's, he is one of the 300. What would happen is, is they didn't all live in Jerusalem. They would, they would be scattered around in Jewish provinces and Jewish communities around. And then whenever there was a big deal going on, they would summon the Sanhedrin to come in. And if you saw one, you knew it because of the way they dressed, because of the way they acted. You know, for lack of a better term, they were kind of like a pope. How many of you know what I'm saying? They were just like, that, that was them. They were, they were there. Look at what it says in verse 2. It says, so this guy, he was among the Jews. In verse 2, it says, who came to Jesus at night, remember that, and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know without any doubt that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs, these wonders, these attesting miracles that you do unless God is with him. Now, what I want you to notice is this. Nicodemus is a member of the Sanhedrin, and he goes to Jesus, and he said, we know. So the Sanhedrin is like, God's on this guy. We can't get him in our box, but we can see nobody. He said, we know. And then you know, since he came at night, he did not have their consent to go see him. He's sneaking in because he's like, you know what? I just got to find out. I just got to know. And so he goes in to Jesus and, and he said, with no doubt, he said, we know that God is with you and God is on you. Do you know that the most popular scripture in the Bible that many of the world even knows is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you know who Jesus said that to? He said it to Nicodemus. It's only recorded one time in the Bible and God could see where Nicodemus was and God be Jesus began to draw him him and said, it is not your religious pedigree. You must be born again, born of the Spirit. You, were, you came once involuntarily, but now it is totally your will that says, God, I give you everything. Yeah. I mean, how many of you are Forever 21 shoppers? Forever 21, Forever 21, it's on the bottom of all their bags. 
<laughs> Nicodemus didn't know he was going to be a sales pitch for Forever 21. It's <laughs> in and out Burger, how many of you believe good hamburgers, I said good, are going to be in heaven? How many of you know? On the bottom of every in and out Burger cup, how many of you have had in and out And I'll pray for the rest of you. Um, is is John 3.16. Look at what it says in John 7.50. This is the other account. Well, actually, I'm just going to refer to it. But John 7.50 is the Sanhedrin is gathered. And they're ticked at Jesus. And they're trying to figure out a way to arrest him. And Nicodemus is part of that 300. And they, they begin to come up and conspire on how to arrest him. And Nicodemus speaks up and says, does our law condemn anyone before they've had a chance to have a trial? And they turned on him and just, just, just verbally slapped him. And he backed down, quickly backed down and didn't say another word. In John 19, verse 39, after Jesus has been crucified, he shows up with burial spices to take him off the cross and to put him in the tomb. If you study, we have no account of him ever committing to Jesus. But we have three very distinct. So the first group is, I'll call it the the religious box. God, I believe in you. God, I want you. But you got to do it my way. The second group is what I'm going to call the hooked. Everybody say the hooked. Over, the hooked. Overly busy, distracted, searching, but sedated with where they're at. They wanted God. I call it shiny object walk with Jesus. What is a shiny object? Jesus, I want you. What is that? How many of you know what I'm saying? <laughs> How many of you know what I'm saying? I love you, Lord. Whoa. How many of you know what I'm saying? It's shiny object, Jesus, is Lord, I want you. This would be the crowds around Jesus. This would have been, you know, the Amplified Bible says that there were times that the crowd around Jesus was so intense that it was suffocating. You couldn't breathe. That's how intense it was. There were times in Jesus' ministry, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 3,000. See, there's an awareness, this group of God, and even an awareness of my need. But there's this hamster wheel of life of busyness. And I'm just sedated by it. I'm just going through it. I, I, I realize and God touches me and I get a few goosebumps and oh my gosh, this is great. But all of a sudden I get sucked back into and I'm just kind of going through and, and going through the, just the motions. I want God. God, I want you. But oh my gosh, I got, oh, I got it. Okay, here, I'm going to do it. Okay, I'm gonna, I got to do it. Do you know in Mark 4, Jesus talked about four different heart conditions and in one of them he said, was the distractions of this age. He was talking about his word working in our life and us experiencing God's best. And he said that one of the greatest hindrances is just distractions. We just get distracted. We just, you know, we we just get distracted and we just, you know what I'm saying? See, with God, this group is God, I'm in, I love you, I want you. And then all of a sudden I'm out. And I'm in and I'm out. And then I'm in, I'm fired up, and oh my gosh, I'm going in, and then I'm out. And, and I believe that, that this group, you look at them in Jesus' ministry, and he was constantly reaching toward them. The third group, the third group, is I'm going to call them the discouraged, unable or unwilling to get past something. And I said unable or unwilling because sometimes in our life, we get hit with stuff and we don't know how to get past it. It's so discouraging. It's so weighty. It's so hard. And we're just like, oh my gosh. And, and God is saying, I'm going to lead you and I'm going to help you. But you have got to realize that this thing is trying to bury you where you're at. The unwilling is those that have been through something or a setback and they just pretty much say, you know what, forget it. You know what, I'm so discouraged. God should have done it this way. He should have done it that way. He should have consulted me. This is ridiculous. I don't get it. I don't understand it. 
And you know, you, you stop and you think about the discouraged, the unable, the unwilling to get past something. This is what I have found out in, um, in my own just observation. If, is anyone that has ever followed God has faced discouragement and found out that in fact, discourage, facing discouragement and overcoming it is part of God's development plan for our life. Because he never promised us a life without discouragement. How many of you found it's really easy to walk in love as long as you don't have to deal with people? How many of you know what I'm saying? It's, I, get, you know, it's, I got my dog. You know, it's, 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 it's it, what we have to understand in our life is handling discouragement toward Jesus rather than away from Jesus what we've got to realize is it's in the top five things that God wants to teach me to handle so that he can use it to bless my life. See, I find this that sometimes some of the most discouraging things that I've been through, if I don't let the discouragement take possession of my heart and I keep my satellite dish turned toward the Lord, open to his word and go in the direction that he wants me to, I find that they turn to some of the greatest blessings in my life because it turns to muscle instead of just a discouraging downer in my life. See, it's learning to stay inspired by God in his word and not let discouragements rob us. We've got to avoid the God unless you do this. I'm just not going to go. I'm just not going to be in. And the, you're probably waiting for the example of this. This is Thomas in the Bible. Thomas. And I want to read John 20, verse 24 and 25. But Thomas, one of the 12 disciples, who was called Didymus, the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. This is Jesus' first appearance. So the other disciples kept telling him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the marks of the nails and put my finger into the nail prints and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas was one of the 12, but was so affected by when it didn't go the way he thought he couldn't get past it. He just couldn't get past it. And I wonder today how many of us love God, want God, but we've had a setback in our life that we've not maybe been willing to or maybe we feel ill-equipped to get past it. I want to tell you, Jesus came to give you strength and to give you the ability and to breathe hope into your heart to get past it rather than navigate with it or carry it in your backpack for the rest of your life. See, he has a relationship with God. Thomas does. He even believes, but is controlled by his negative experience rather than a relationship with God. What should be the rear view mirror has turned into the windshield. And Jesus comes. And the fourth group is this. I'm going to call it the hungry. Those that love God and want him in their life, they make mistakes, but they won't quit. I just want to, just an observation. Did you notice that all of these groups are messed up some way or another? Did you notice that? Realize the answer is not not being messed up. The answer is knowing who to go to in our mess up. The answer, Jesus didn't come for those who had it together. He said, I came for those who knew they needed help. And then maybe you're here and you look at the, I, I look at this, is these are the people that make a mistake, but they've learned how to get back up. They wanted more. They were willing to believe. They were not perfect by a long shot, but they settled that, God, you are better than anything natural, and I'm not going to stop where I'm at because I'm coming after you, and there's nothing natural in my life that can satisfy the deepest longing of my heart. No person, no amount of money, no amount of prestige, no position. God, only you water my soul. And you say, well, who was that? Peter denied Jesus. Think about this for a moment. Peter and Judas' mistake were pretty close. 
It was pretty close. Peter three times. And the last time he cursed. So I never, I, I'm not going to, you know, I don't always have anything. <laughs> How many of you know? <laughs> but when Jesus resurrected, it says in Mark 3.16, what some of Jesus' first words was, go tell the disciples and Peter that I'm alive. Who else? James and John. The Bible tells us that after the crucifixion, they went back to fishing. And Jesus found them in their boats, and he was on the seashore, and the Bible tells us that there were fish on the fire, and he called to them and told them to come in. I just want to... This is how my brain thinks. Where did those fish come from? How many of you are with me on that? How many of you? I mean, Jesus was a carpenter. He wasn't a fisherman. I mean, I, can I just, my, my brain was like, Jesus said, fire. Poof. I'll take the first 12 volunteers. You know what I'm saying? Whoop, 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 whoop. They're all on the fire. And the disciples came in. It's like, how's the fish boys better than I've ever had? It's because God cooked it. <laughs> I believe can I find myself in any of these four this morning? Right now. Maybe you're here and you're a Nicodemus and you got to control it. You got to control it. You got a sharp wit. You got a sharp intellect. You figured God out and he's going to fit into your box. But I'm telling you, he will never fit into your box because the number one thing in a relationship with him is humility. God, I don't know and I need you. Maybe you're here and you're part of the crowd. You have a relationship with God, but it is hot and cold. It is up and down. It is, yes, I'm 100%. I feel the goosebumps. Oh my gosh, God, you're tearing it up too. What is going on? You know what I'm saying? Just the distractions, what's going on? Maybe you're here and you've been discouraged. You've been knocked down. And maybe till this day, You've been either unwilling or it may be unable to get up. I want to tell you today, Jesus came to help you up. Amen. Or maybe you're like Peter, James, and John, as you have come to the place where you're like, I've made mistakes, but I'm not going to fall on my butt. I'm going to fall on my knees because I know where that brings me. I know where that gets me. I know where it brings me. I want to look in closing, in an account of something that an angel said to Joseph about Jesus before his birth. And it's in Matthew 1, 21. And the angel said this to Joseph, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Amplified says it's the Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua, which means savior. This is what he'll do. He will save his people from their sins. That is, prevent them from failing and missing the true end and scope of life, which is God. Look at that statement, the true end and scope. Two different things. End is when I get buried. Scope is how I live right now. Perspective right now. This is why Jesus came. It's why he came. God sent Jesus so we wouldn't miss the true end and scope of life, which is a relationship with him. I believe that this Easter 2021, that God is saying, I want an awareness over my people, and I want a heart adjustment toward me. I need them to stop and just look and say, where am I at? What part, which crowd, which group am I, am I, can I see any nuances? Can I see any kind of bendings right now in my life? Maybe you're here and you have been sedated by the hamster wheel of life and you're just kind of negative and you're just kind of grinding and you're just going and you're just like, and you're like, I'm not happy, I'm not fulfilled. You will never be happy and never be fulfilled until you're walking close with God. Why? Because you are not an animal. You were created in the image of God. God, to have a relationship with God. And he is the only one that can fill you with life. He's the only one. Look at the disciples after the crucifixion. I believe that. The Bible says that after Jesus called him in and they all had the fish, that it says this about Jesus. 
that he rebuked them for unbelief and hardness of heart. And I want you to think about that for a moment. They were discouraged because he had passed away. They had gone back to fishing. And then he rebukes them for unbelief and hardness of heart. I'm like, Lord, that's kind of harsh. You know that if they didn't respond to that, they wouldn't have made it down the road. And he challenged them and he said, guys, come on, I told you about this. I told you about this. I told you about this. And my question to us today is, am I open to God challenging me to go deeper than I've ever gone before in my walk with him? Am I open to that right now? Maybe he's asking you to see life differently. Maybe he's asking you to think differently. You know, when you came in the door, you should have got a little cup of communion. If you did not get one, lift your hand because they're going to pass. They're going to just kind of, if you didn't get one, we've got some over here. We're going to be receiving communion today. And what communion is when you look in the Bible is it is a time of pausing in our life where we stop and we pause. We're just from all the busyness, everything that's going on, and we call to remembrance everything that Jesus came for. And then we identify with him in our life. And I wonder today how many of us, God is saying, you know, I'm a, you say, well, you're the pastor. You know, I almost got to do this every day. It's like, Lord, I, just, I identify with you today. Amen. Lord, I thank you that you're with me. Yes, and Lord, I identify with your death, your burial, and your resurrection so that there's more to life than just the natural grind. There's more to life than just breathing and going through the motions. But Lord, you came so I could have an everyday, moment-by-moment -moment relationship with God. Everybody got them? I can't see the balcony because they got... The tanning lights on up here there's a bunch in the balcony that need them as well did you guys need them in the balcony you got them they're all set hey give the balcony a shout out come on hey y'all that are watching online come on back it's time to come back time to come back I want you to just open it up How many of you think they would have had these little cups when Jesus was around? <laughs> Just take the bread. And the Bible says that after the meal, just Jesus lifted up a, a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And as you study, what you find out is his body was broken to bring healing to our lives. Physical healing emotional healing, relational healing. His body was broken to bring healing to our lives. And I want you today to identify over your life with the healing power of God by just simply stopping and saying, Lord, I receive your healing. Go ahead and receive the bread. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, as we look at this little cup of grape juice, in our mind's eye, we reflect back to the Last Supper that you lifted up a cup of wine and you said this is the cup of the new covenant that is going to be ratified in your shed blood for the forgiveness of sins, thus restoring us to a right relationship with God that isn't earned, it's just received. Lord, we come before you now. And Lord, we identify that our sins are forgiven. That we are the rescued of the Lord. We are the redeemed of the Lord. And Lord, as we receive this, God, we thank you. Go ahead and receive Thank you, Lord. Stand to your feet if you would. 
God, today, this Easter, Lord, as we have reflected on four different groups that you saw fit to put in the Bible for us, for this 2021, to reflect our life on. Lord, I pray that your word sticks. Lord, I pray that there's a deepness to who you are and what you're doing. And Lord, as we come before you in worship, Lord, we identify with your goodness. We identify with your love. We identify with your mercy. God, we identify with your grace over our life. And Lord, we say thank you, Jesus. Say that with me. Say thank you, Lord. Now say it like you mean it. Thank you, Lord. Now say it online in your home too. Thank you, Lord.